Let's get uh, started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to ASIC seminar series. I'm John, the seminar coordinator. And together with me is Ms. Uh, Chris Sandra Matney, Kathy. She's our communication specialist. And Kathy and I will be today's moderator. And today we have our distinguished speaker, Professor Becky and Alexander joining us from University of Washington. Uh, let me give you a few tips before we start up. So this seminar is being recorded and it will be later published in our YouTube channel. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat and Kathy will read them out. And or you can raise your virtual hand and Kathy will unmute you as appropriate. You are welcome to bring up any questions. And let me give a brief introduction about the speak, speaker before she start. So Professor Becky Alexander is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric Science, and she is the director of the program on climate change at the University of Washington. She received her PhD in chemistry at the UCSD and was awarded a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoc Fellowship to work in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at Harvard. Her research group and UW studies air pollution and feedbacks between atmospheric chemistry and climate using ice core and aerosol observations and global chemistry climate models. Let's welcome the speaker, and um, I will give the board to um, Professor Banky and Alexander. Please proceed. Okay, um, thank you, John, and thank you for the invitation to present today. I'll be talking about my uh, group's uh, work on investigating the role of reactive halogens in both air pollution and in climate. So I'll begin by uh, giving you a brief introduction to the importance of reactive halogens in the global atmosphere with a focus on tropos the troposphere. And then I'll provide a combination of uh, ice core observations and global modeling studies uh, that shows evidence for both climate-driven changes in tropospheric reactive halogens as well as evidence for anthropogenic-driven changes. And then if there's time at the end, I'll present uh, one study that my group did looking at the influence of one geoengineering strategy on uh, the chemistry of the atmosphere and associated uh, radiative feedbacks. So first I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, from the start here. Uh, I'll be showing ice core observations that were done uh, by Jihan Koldai at South Dakota State, Lei Gung at USTC, and Joe McConnell at DRI. And the modeling work that I'll be showing you has uh, really uh, been a, a big group effort. Uh, much of the work I'll be showing you was completed by my current graduate student, Xu Ting Jai my former postdoc, Hannah Horowitz, now at the University of Illinois, uh, as well as um, folks at the University of York and Harvard. So I will be talking about the halogen group here today, which uh, is uh, on the right of the periodic table, just next to the noble gases. And the uh, species that are important for tropospheric chemistry in particular are chlorine, uh, bromine, and iodine. All three are important, and I will be briefly at least talking about all three today, but uh, mostly about, about chlorine uh, today. So most of us are familiar with the importance of reactive halogen chemistry in the atmosphere with respect to its role in stratospheric ozone depletion. So this is showing a satellite image of ozone over Antarctica in the springtime in 1979 and again in 2008. And so these blue colors represent very low ozone concentrations or the ozone hole that occurs every year in the spring over Antarctica. And we know, of course, that the uh, origin of this is uh, coming from uh, reactive halogen chemistry, 
uh, which whose source is chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs that have been emitted into the atmosphere uh, from human activity. Now, we also know that the hole that occurs over Antarctica every spring uh, requires another ingredient, and that is polar stratospheric clouds. And polar stratospheric clouds is important uh, for heterogeneous chemistry in the atmosphere. And this is something that we really recognized as a result of the ozone hole and have since recognized to be ubiquitous throughout the atmosphere. And so polar stratospheric clouds are, provide some ice crystals upon which reactions can occur that wouldn't happen in the gas phase. So for example, a gas phase, um, uh, HCl and chlorine nitrate, they wouldn't react together in the gas phase very efficiently, but they can both be absorbed onto the surface of an ice crystal and there they can react with one another to form new chemical species, uh, nitric acid, which remains on the ice, and then molecular chlorine, which goes back into the gas phase. And when the sun comes up in the springtime, then uh, it photolyzes uh, molecular chlorine into the chlorine radical, which can then go on to destroy ozone. Now, in the troposphere, we also knew around in the mid-1980s that that reactive halogens could play a role in ozone destruction there, here at the surface. So this is an early study by Leonard Berry, uh, which shows observations of both ozone and filtrable bromine uh, during the month of April in 1986. And so what you can see from these, this figure is that the surface uh, ozone depletion uh, goes down to near zero values during episodic events. And this occurs regularly in the Arctic springtime, which is what's shown here, but also happens in Antarctica. And there's also a strong anti-correlation here between ozone and filterable bromine. And so by filterable bromine, we mean anything that contains bromine that will collect on an aerosol filter. And so that includes particulate bromide, as well as reactive gas phase uh, bromine species, or BRY. So I'll be referring to the reactive halogens as uh, families. They're uh, families of reactive species. Uh, so for example, the BRY family is the sum of all of these reactive gas phase species. And I've highlighted in red here, the species that are soluble in water and thus are likely collecting on these filters and uh, partly responsible for the high concentrations of the bromine uh, that was observed and plotted in this figure. And we've since uh, had other observations that show very high BRO concentrations in springtime in both polar regions, in Arctic on the top and Antarctic in the bottom, and regions of melting sea ice. And so this occurs every year in the spring, this high BRO, which is one of the BRY species, uh, can occur and thus result in these sort of episodic ozone depletion events at the surface. So later in the 90s, we began to realize that reactive halogens can also play a role for the ozone budget throughout the atmosphere, even into the tropics. And these are just two uh, examples of studies that demonstrated that. Uh, the figure on the left shows some observations of ozone, the black dots, over a 24-hour period over the tropical Atlantic Ocean. And these observations uh, were attempted to be simulated uh, by a model. And these kind of low concentrations that were observed later in the day in the afternoon could not be achieved in the model that didn't have reactive halogen chemistry. Uh, only with the reactive halogen chemistry could we explain those relatively low ozone concentrations that were observed. And there's also been much more direct um, evidence of significant concentrations of reactive halogens, such as this example here on the right, which shows observed BRO over the tropical West Pacific as a function of altitude. And so what you see here is that uh, BRO concentrations, um, which are one of the easier reactive halogen species to measure, 
Not that it's easy, it's not, but it's one of the more frequently observed species, um, is on the order of zero to one PPT, parts per trillion. So the concentrations are very low, parts per trillion, much lower than ozone PPB, but this is analogous to the stratosphere, uh, whereas you don't need very much to destroy ozone because of these catalytic uh, recycling reactions that occur in the stratosphere. Similar reactions occur in the troposphere. And now we think that halogens are responsible for 10 to 60 percent of ozone loss in the tropical and subtropical marine boundary layer, which is pretty significant because even today, most atmospheric chemistry models don't include comprehensive reactive halogen chemistry in their tropospheric chemical mechanism, so really missing an important part of the ozone budget. So the chemistry of tropospheric ozone destruction has some similarities to what's occurring in the stratosphere. The first one is that heterogeneous chemistry is also important uh, in the troposphere as it is in the stratosphere, except instead of the chemistry occurring on ice crystals and polar stratospheric clouds, the chemistry is largely occurring on sea salt aerosol. So sea salt aerosol not only provides a surface upon which heterogeneous reactions can occur, but that also provides a source of halides, chloride, and bromide um, where the reactive halogens can then form. Uh, there are catalytic, and cycles, it's catalytic cycles that are also involved in the ozone destruction that can lead to significant ozone destruction despite very low concentrations. And some of these reactions can be nonlinear. So I'm going to give you just one example of, of this uh, using a bromine. So this will be my most sort of chemistry intensive slide that I show you here. So for uh, those of you who aren't chemists, um, there won't be too much of this, but I do want to give you some details so you can begin to understand some of the important uh, reactions here. So uh, methyl bromide would be an example of a species that's emitted in the gas phase of the atmosphere. It has natural sources from oceanic phytoplankton, for example, and it can represent kind of a seed for the formation of tropospheric reactive halogens. So methyl bromide can be oxidized in the atmosphere to form a bromine radical, uh, which can then react with ozone to form BRO, which is often measured in the atmosphere and destroying ozone. So some of this BRO can react with NO to form NO2, and this would in fact represent a null cycle for ozone destruction. There would be no net ozone destruction. But actually most BRO doesn't react with NO2, NO, it reacts with NO2 to form bromine nitrate. And bromine nitrate is important because it can uh, easily hydrolyze on the surface of an aerosol or in a cloud droplet to form nitric acid, HNO3, representing a sink for NOx in the atmosphere, which is another way to reduce ozone formation and thus uh, play in a role in the ozone budget in the troposphere. But also it's important because it forms HOBr. And HOBr is a really a critical ingredient here uh, because HOBr is soluble and it can react in a sea salt aerosol with halides such as bromide to form a BR2, molecular bromine. And this, um, as you can see, involves heterogeneous chemistry. It's nonlinear because it's uh, taking one uh, Br atom to produce two reactive Br atoms. And um, also you can see now these cycling reactions that involve ozone destruction in the atmosphere. And it's this heterogeneous reaction that is responsible for these so-called bromine explosion events that I've showed you in the satellite observations over the Arctic and Antarctic that lead to these ozone depletion events in the springtime. So the largest source of reactive bromine then is these heterogeneous reactions on sea salt aerosol. So the sea salt aerosol is really critical for the formation of reactive halogens, reactive bromine. And so I've mentioned these, uh, the BRY family of reactive halogens before, but uh, we also will talk in terms of CLY and IY, so reactive chlorine and reactive iodine, which consist of these species that are listed here. And I've highlighted in red the most abundant species in each family. Now for 
CLY, the most abundant species by far, over 95%, is in the form of hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, relative to all the other species in the CLY family, isn't very reactive. And so sometimes we subtract HCl out of the CLY family and call that CL star. So I'll come back to that later in the talk. So uh, the largest source, I've mentioned that the largest source of bromine, reactive bromine, is heterogeneous reactions on sea salt aerosol. Sea salt aerosol is also critical for the formation of reactive chlorine, uh, but the mechanism is a little bit different. In this case, it's uh, through acid displacement of HCl from sea salt aerosol. So sea salt aerosol will be emitted from the ocean surface or blowing snow from the surface of sea ice. It's alkaline initially, and acidic gases like nitric acid and sulfuric acid will condense onto these alkaline aerosols, acidify the aerosols, and displace HCl into the gas phase into the atmosphere. There are also more minor sources of HCl from coal combustion or biomass burning. So for um, reactive iodine, it's a little bit different. The largest source isn't from the aerosol because iodine is not significant in sea salt aerosol. The largest source is actually coming from the ocean surface. So this figure shows estimated iodide concentrations in the ocean surface uh, using a machine a learning algorithm, which takes the sparse observations into account. The iodide to iodate ratio in the ocean is controlled by biology. And the iodide is important here because it can provide a source of reactive halogens. And so ozone uh, will deposit onto the surface of the ocean, react with the iodide in the surface of the ocean, and form gas phase H2 and H2I, HOI. And this is the largest source of reactive iodide in the atmosphere. So seawater is important, either surface seawater or sea salt aerosols for the formation of all three reactive halogen species. So two things to keep in mind here. Halogens are both a coupled and nonlinear system. So I've given you an example of a nonlinear reaction, this debromination reaction of HOBr with bromide and sea salt aerosol to form Br2. But also these different halogen species are coupled with one another. They're not entirely independent of one another. So this example of HOBr reacting with Br- can also be applied with HOCl, HOI, and bromide and iodide. So if you change one reactive halogen species, you're likely to influence the other two um, in some way. So, uh, how does all this impact our understanding of tropospheric chemistry? So this is showing uh, a study by Tomas Sherwin where he compared ozone as simulated by a global model. This is ozone in the troposphere uh, in the model with and without reactive halogen chemistry. And what he found was that when he added reactive halogen chemistry to the model, this resulted in a decrease of ozone uh, in the troposphere, a global mean decrease of 19%. So this is a pretty significant um, decrease in ozone and also in our understanding of what controls the ozone budget in the troposphere. And uh, the plot on the right shows the different sinks for ozone in the troposphere and that halogens account for 25 to 40% of ozone loss in the troposphere. And this range is consistent with the range, it's within the range reported um, in observations. Okay. And this is important, not just for ozone, but the implications for the oxidation capacity of the atmosphere in general. So how reactive halogens will also decrease NOx, a global mean of 3%, and also HOx. Uh, OH is one of the important uh, in, uh, parts of the Hox family, and the reduction in OH was on the order of 10% in the troposphere, and this in turn resulted in a reduction and an increase in the methane lifetime of 11%, which is a significant increase. So you can see the implications that this can have then uh, all the way through to air pollution and also climate. So I don't want to leave the impression that uh, we understand all of this really well. Uh, we don't. 
this. Uh, putting reactive halogen chemistry in the troposphere in the GS Chem model is something that we've done only in the past five years, so we're still really learning about its importance. And um, the observations of tropospheric reactive halogens are sparse. Uh, they're difficult to measure due to their low concentrations and their short lifetimes. And sometimes observations using different techniques, different instruments do not always agree with one another. And those two things make it difficult to assess model performance due to lack of observations. And so there's a lot of work still to be done in our understanding. Uh, but we I do think, at least as far as we know, we have a fairly comprehensive uh, tropospheric reactive halogen chemistry in the model. So I'm going to talk about really what got me interested uh, in uh, reactive halogen chemistry, and um, that was evidence for climate-driven changes in tropospheric reactive halogens. And this is coming from ice core measurements. And there are a few different ice core measurements that suggest that tropospheric reactive halogens are higher in cold climates compared to warm climates. Um, and those are listed here. In the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about two of them. Uh, nitrate isotopes, which is uh, something that I've measured in my lab and what got me interested in them. And then I'll also uh, mention some observations of sea salt aerosol from ice cores. So nitrate oxygen isotopes uh, can re record the importance of different oxidants in nitrate formation. So NO gets emitted into the atmosphere from combustion or lightning or soil microbial activity. NO is oxidized to NO2. NO2, in turn, is oxidized to nitric acid. Nitric acid is soluble, so it partitions between the gas and the particle phase. And both the gas and the particle phase then get deposited to the surface. And if it's deposited to an ice sheet, then you can drill an ice core and measure its isotopes from the past. Um, now, if we look at the oxidants involved in the oxidation of NO to NO2 and NO2 to nitric acid, uh, we have kind of two different categories. We have uh, the species indicated in red, ozone and halogen monoxides, which yield a large O17 excess of 39 per mil, and Hox, HO2 and OH, these blue species, which yield a low O17 excess of zero per mil. And so if we measure the isotopes of nitrate, then it's basically a measure of the relative abundance of the species in red to the species in blue, so ozone plus the halogen monoxides relative to Hox. And so this plot shows our uh, first measurements from a Greenland ice core over a glacial interglacial cycle. So the y-axis, uh, as you go to the left, uh, it's getting colder as you go to the left. And they, sorry, that's the x-axis. The y-axis is our proxy, which is just a ratio of the red to the blue species here. And so you can see as it gets colder, this ratio is increasing. Now we also measured over two rapid climate change events during the last glacial period, Dansgaard Oshkar events, number 12 and 13, if you're familiar with that. And we found something similar, at least for the larger climate transition. So these black dots here show a similar relationship between temperature and oxidants on the glacial interglacial time scale. Um, these black dots represent the rapid warming and the rapid cooling parts of the Dansgaard Oshkar events. Uh, in contrast, during the gradual cooling phase of the Dansgaard Oscar events, we see uh, the opposite uh, relationship here. So my colleague, uh, Joël Savarino in Grenoble, France, did the same measurement, uh, this time from an Antarctic ice core from East Antarctica over two glacial interglacial cycles. And he found the same relationship that I have found in Greenland, uh, my group has found, which is as it gets colder, uh, the ratio of red to blue oxidants is increasing. So this similar relationship in these two polar regions over different um, time scales suggests that these glacial interglacial or climate driven changes in oxidants occur on the global scale, that it's not just a local phenomenon. And so this is telling us that um, this ratio of red to blue, uh, there's three ways to get this to increase in cold climates. 
you can increase ozone, you can increase the halogen monoxides, or you can decrease Hawk. Now, I've mentioned that the implementation of reactive halogen chemistry in the troposphere is really new in global models and, and is not in all of them. Um, so there aren't any model estimates of the um, halogens at this point, uh, but there are plenty of estimates of ozone and hawks and how those have varied with climate. And so this is one study of several, um, the most recent one done by um, and Ming Cheng Wang here at the University of Washington working with Cheng Fu. And he used the Wacom model uh, to estimate uh, how ozone has changed in the glacial climate. And if we focus here on the troposphere, uh, he found, as well as many other studies, that ozone is lower in the glacial climate. And this is um, expected because uh, emissions of ozone precursors like NOx and VOCs are temperature dependent, so you get less of emissions of these species as it gets colder, and so you have less ozone formation. Uh, he also estimated the change in OH, and this did uh, go in the right direction, unlike ozone, to explain the observations. However, the change in OH is much lower than the change in ozone. So if you calculate the ratio of ozone to Hawks, uh, it, le it decreases, which is the opposite of what we're observing in ice cores. And this is pretty similar to what previous modeling studies have predicted. So all models suggest that ozone decreases in cold climates. Most models suggest that Hawks is relatively buffered against changes in climate. It, it's pretty constant. So with that, the only other way to reconcile the observations uh, of, in ice cores with the uh, models is that the reactive halogen would have to increase. So why would we expect that to have occurred? Well, I mentioned that sea salt aerosol is the largest source of reactive halogens in the atmosphere. And we know from ice core measurements of sodium, most sodium is from sea salt, that sodium concentrations in ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland. These are just two examples. This is uh, the, the case no matter where you drill your ice core, that the sodium concentrations are higher in cold climates than they are in warm climates. And if you correct for the change in snow accumulation rate, uh, you get a factor of two to five increase in a sea salt deposition flux in glacial periods relative to warm interglacial periods. And so um, all else being equal, if you increase sea salt aerosol in the atmosphere, you'll tend to enhance your tropospheric reactive halogen formation with implications for our understanding of the oxidation capacity of the atmosphere. So a summary of the glacial interglacial ice core observations, two proxies that I showed you, as well as some others that I didn't have time to mention, may point to an increased tropospheric reactive halogen abundance in cold climates. There could, of course, be other explanations. There have been no model studies to date to, um, that estimate how reactive halogen changes may have changed with past climate, and that is something that my group is actively working on at the moment. So I'll um, move on to the uh, second part of my talk, which is the evidence for anthropogenic influence on tropospheric reactive halogens. And I'm going to focus here on ice core chlorine records from the Arctic. Now, we're also looking at bromine and iodine, um, but I'm just going to focus on chlorine. This is uh, in progress work uh, by my graduate student, Xu Ting Zhai, and we've, we're farthest along in our analysis of the chlorine. We've done a number, I looked at a number of different ice cores, which are shown on this figure here. I'm going to focus on our analysis of the summit core and also show you some previous work uh, from an ice core in the French Alps. And I'll be focusing in particular on the measurements of the chlorine excess. So chlorine excess is calculated based on the measured chloride and sodium concentrations in the ice core, uh, correcting for what we expect to, um, the amount of chloride we expect to measure based on the sodium. So you can either have an excess of chloride based on what you expect from seawater or technically a depletion, though most of the time we observe an excess. 
And we can think of chlorine excess as being a proxy for the CLY, the reactive chlorine uh, chemistry in the troposphere. So the first uh, measurements here were done uh, in the uh, Col du Dome Glacier in the French Alps and um, in 2002 by Michel Legrand. And this is showing measurements from 1925 to about 1995. And here he's plotting HCl, um, but his HCl is calculated uh, in the same way that I'm calculating chlorine excess. Uh, so it's essentially the same thing. And that's pretty reasonable because most of the CLY in the atmosphere is indeed in the form of HCl. So what he found was that HCl increased after 1950. And this was interpreted as originating from an increase in acid displacement of HCl from the sea salt aerosol. And this, of course, is what we think is the largest source of HCl and CLY in the troposphere is this acid displacement. And we could expect this increase because we know that uh, anthropogenic activity has significantly changed the acidity of the atmosphere since pre-industrial times. So this plot on the left shows ice core measurements of sulfate from summit Greenland uh, between 1850 and 2007 uh, in these black dots. And the solid lines are uh, sulfur emissions from anthropogenic activity, which is mostly in the form of SO2 from coal combustion uh, from North America, Europe, and the former Soviet Union, and of course the sum of the total. And so you can see that the trends in the ice core mirror the trends in the emissions with increases after 1900, which really um, uh, increase even further after 1940, peak around 1975, and then decrease after that. And the peak in 1975, of course, is uh, because of the implementation of air pollution mitigation strategies in North America and Europe in the 1970s. And that's also reflected in observations of total sulfur deposition at the surface. Uh, this is an example in the United States where we see sulfur deposition measurements in 2000 to 2002, and again in 2015 to 2017, showing substantial reductions as a result of these air pollution mitigation strategies. So one might expect then, if the largest source of reactive chlorine in the atmosphere is from acidification of sea salt aerosols that this might change, they, it might change um, in concert here with changes in acidity. So uh, this is showing two um, measurements, um, measurements of chlorine and sodium from two central Greenland ice cores. The, each ice core is a different color and the raw data are the, the light colors and the uh, more solid colors um, are the 10 year uh, running mean with the outliers such as volcanic eruptions um, subtracted out. So here we have sodium and chlorine from these two ice cores. Also note that the techniques that were uh, measured um, that were used to do these measurements were different for each ice core. One measured the ions and the other measured total abundance. They're similar nonetheless. And this is showing the relationship between chlorine and sodium here, um, because of course most chlorine is coming from sea salt aerosol as indicated by sodium. And we can see that the sodium or the sea salt aerosol explains about 50% of the variability in chlorine in these summit ice cores. So that something else may be um, also needed to explain the variability as observed in these ice core records. So if we look at the bottom two plots here, this is showing the chlorine excess, which we calculate, and the acidity. And we might expect these to vary similarly. So here, if you look at this acidity, it looks similar to the sulfur the position that I showed you before, where we get uh, increases after 1900, especially after 1940, uh, peaking around 1975 and decreasing after that. And so if we look at the relationship between the chlorine excess and acidity, uh, since 1940, when acidity really varied dramatically above uh, the pre-industrial levels, you can see that the acidity explains about 70% of the variability in the chlorine excess. So we investigated this further using the GSChem model, where we ran the model 
uh, with comprehensive tropospheric reactive halogen chemistry in three different time periods, pre-industrial in 1750, peak acidity in 1975, and present day, which is the top of the ice core in 2007. In these simulations, the only thing we let vary were anthropogenic emissions because we wanted to isolate the anthropogenic impacts to see how much can anthropogenic emissions explain the observed variability of chlorine excess or um, the non-sea salt chloride. And so to do that, we held the meteorology constant and, uh, and just let the anthropogenic emissions change. So that means that the sea salt aerosol itself, the source of the sea salt aerosol is not changing. So any changes in reactive chlorine chemistry would be entirely driven by anthropogenic activity. And this is important because sometimes the chlorine measurements and ice cores are used to explain uh, other factors such as changes in sea ice extent. So we're exploring to what degree this other process can explain the observed variability. So our, here are results in our three different time periods that I mentioned. This is showing a surface CLY concentrations. Most of this is in the form of HCl. And so you can see the increases here uh, in the continental outflow regions as expected because you need sea salt and you need acidity, which is being emitted over the continents by anthropogenic activity. So you see these uh, sort of highest concentrations in these continental outflow regions. And then we can look at the differences between these time periods and compare that with the observed trends in the ice core. So this is showing differences um, on the bottom left here uh, between peak acidity minus pre-industrial. So it's showing an increase throughout this domain, which is 30 degrees north to 90 degrees north, and uh, increase in uh, reactive halogens as a result, reactive chlorine, um, during from, from pre-industrial to peak acidity. And then over here on the right, this shows the trends from peak acidity through to the present day. You can see the picture is a bit more complicated here. We had uniform increases from pre-industrial to peak acidity, but since then we've had some regions where we've seen decreases over uh, North America and Europe, and other regions you've seen increases such as over uh, Eastern, Eastern Asia, and that's because of the very different uh, trajectories uh, in emission or trends in emissions in these time periods, whereas emissions, some emissions have decreased in North America and Europe, but during this time period, at least, they continue to increase in China. And so if we look at just the source region of our ice core, which is really North America and Europe, it's showing increases from pre-industrial to peak acidity and smaller decreases from peak acidity to present day, which is consistent with our chlorine excess uh, records in the summit ice core. So we can dig into the model to find out the causes of these trends. And this is showing the a, a source of HCl on the model in our three different time periods. And so consistent with our understanding, the largest source in the pre-industrial is from these acid displacement reactions. And as we go into our 1975 peak acidity, we are seeing a significant increase as we expect in this acid displacement source of, of HCl. However, we also see a significant increase from NOx, which I'll describe here in a moment. And this more involves heterogeneous chemistry, uh, somewhat similar to what I described earlier. Now, when we move from peak acidity to the present day, this is showing the entire domain. So it includes the effect of East Asia, which causes an overall increase in this region. Uh, the acid displacement uh, kind of levels off, and that's um, due to a combination of differing trends in North America, Europe, and East Asia, but also by the fact that aerosol acidity over this time period has been buffered by ammonia. So there's been observations and thermodynamic calculations that have shown that despite the decrease in SO2 emissions, there hasn't been a corresponding decrease in aerosol acidity because of the buffering induced by ammonia. This isn't the case for clouds. Cloud water pH has definitely gone up, but we haven't seen the same thing happen in aerosols. And hence, we don't see a big change in the acid displacement source during this time period. We do, however, see a big change in the source originating from NOx. 
So if we look into this a little bit more detail, we have these three time periods, and instead of HCL, I'm showing you the CL star. So this is the CLY family minus HCL. We're looking at the more reactive species. These are also increasing over time. Uh, it's the yellow that's driving the majority of the increase, and the yellow is nitrile chloride. Nitrile chloride is forming from reactions of NOx uh, with sea salt chloride to form this one reactive halogen species, nitrile chloride. And that's really driving uh, much of the increase that we're observing. And in fact, now in the present day, the model is predicting that the largest source of reactive halogens or reactive chlorine is no longer acid displacement, but heterogeneous chemistry resulting from NOx. And if you increase one reactive halogen species, nitrile chloride in this case, you increase them all. And so I don't want to scare you with the slide, but this is all of the different reactive halogen, reactive chlorine species here in this uh, dashed box. And the point is, is, you see all these arrows interchanging in between all of them. Uh, they're all interacting with one another in these catalytic cycles. So if you increase one, in this case, nitrile chloride, you're really increase all, increasing all of them. Um, and so we see an increase, for example, in HCl because of that. And we also expect to see an increase in all of the other reactive halogen species as well. So no longer is the sea salt aerosol a source, um, the acid displacement source the largest source, but we think it's um, heterogeneous reactions involving NOx on the surface of sea salt aerosol. And this is important for um, the climate impacts of tropospheric reactive halogens because uh, it affects ozone. So um, this is another study by Thomas Sherwin who ran the model with and without reactive halogen chemistry. And he looked at the change in ozone between pre-industrial and present day. So without reactive halogen chemistry, the change in the ozone burden was 113 teragrams. But after introducing reactive halogen chemistry into the model, it was lower, it was 90 teragrams. And the reason is, is that anthropogenic emissions increase NOx and VOCs, which act to increase ozone, but they also increase reactive halogen chemistry, which acts as a sink for ozone. So we're increasing both the sources and the sinks, and this then modifies the total impact that anthropogenic emissions are having on um, ozone and its associated impacts on air pollution and climate. So um, uh, ice core observations of chlorine excess suggest increases in reactive chlorine abundances since pre-industrial time influenced by both acidity and NOx. And this um, alters our understanding of anthropogenic impacts on tropospheric oxidants like ozone and need to be revisited in the future. So I see I'm about out of time. I have one uh, quick um, look at the future, which is just a couple of slides. So I'll show you our, our look at um, the impacts of one geoengineering strategy on atmospheric chemistry and its associated radiative forcing implications. And that's marine cloud brightening, which is based on these observations that ships that emit sulfur aerosol into the atmosphere brighten clouds, as you can see in these satellite observations of ship tracks. So the proposal then is to have these autonomous ships uh, in um, the surface of the ocean driving around spraying sea salt aerosols in the air to brighten clouds. And this would be particularly effective in regions of stratocumulus cloud formation. So we implemented these into the model, and this shows um, the standard sea salt aerosol concentrations in the model. And then we implemented this marine cloud brightening MCB into the model, which basically just introduces a constant flux, a range, a low and a high based on previous studies in the tropics, constant throughout the year. This is a huge increase up to a factor of 40 in fine mode sea salt aerosol concentrations. We didn't make these numbers up though. This is what was used in the GeoMIT models to achieve a radiative cooling of two watts per meter square or to maintain global mean temperatures out to 2060 to, or to 2070 under the RCP 4.5 scenario. So our question was, what are the radiative forcing implications for the impacts of marine cloud brightening on atmospheric chemistry? In other words, does this alter atmospheric chemistry in such a way to change the methane lifetime? 
So we, uh, this is showing the results of enhanced BRY and CLY in the tropics, as you would expect. You're spraying all the sea salt aerosol, which is a source of reactive halogens, uh, leading to up to a factor of three increase in these species, uh, a 30 to 60% increase in chlorine radical, which is important because this can be a sink for methane. Uh, and a corresponding uh, decrease in ozone, I'll just talk about ozone here, which results um, in a decrease in OH concentrations, which is the main source, uh, see, sorry, the main sink of methane in the atmosphere. So we can put all this together to calculate the rate of forcing implications. We have some warming effects due to, say, increases in methane lifetime due to the OH reduction. But there's also some cooling effects. For example, ozone is a greenhouse gas and ozone decreases. So if you combine these two, the net radiative forcing uh, from the atmospheric chemistry implications of marine cloud brightening uh, is one of cooling uh, between minus 20 and just over minus 50 milliwatts per meter squared. So to put this in perspective, we can compare this with the Two, watt, two watts per meter square radiative forcing that's resulting from the aerosol itself uh, from both the direct and indirect effect on clouds. And you can see that the effect on ozone and the methane lifetime in terms of radiative forcing are negligible compared to the overall radiative effects from the aerosols themselves. So um, this is uh, important because there are some people out there that are proposing to spray chlorine containing aerosols in the atmosphere to reduce the lifetime of methane and thus achieve some cooling to counteract the warming due to CO2. And this is unlikely to be effective based on our preliminary look here. So um, in conclusion, I'll just summarize that uh, there are indications that Reactive halogens have changed significantly in past climate and also due to anthropogenic activity. These can have feedbacks on oxidants such as ozone and then the methane lifetime. And something that we have not considered in past modeling studies that could be a, have a significant impact in our understanding of these processes. And as far as the future goes, the above results suggest that future changes in climate and anthropogenic emissions will have a larger impact on tropospheric reactive halogens than that of geoengineering. But this was just a first look at that uh, geoengineering technique and more studies are needed to confirm this finding. So that's uh, my last slide and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Alexander. So um, if anyone has any questions, they can raise their virtual hand, um, which you can see if you open the participants panel at the bottom right there's a little hand icon um, or you can just chat your questions to me and I can read them aloud oh we have a question from Ross you are unmuted okay hi Becky this is Ross Salowitz thanks for a really great talk I um, have a comment and uh, and a question my comments really tiny but um, for slide 11 where you showed the satellite BRO images you know my group has um, Put out a series of papers saying that a lot of what the satellite sees in those enhancements is the stratosphere coming down, um, basically the tropopause becoming very low altitude, very high pressure, and that mm -hmm. one really has to separate the strat from the trope to see that. So it's just a comment, but some some of that is the is the bromine explosion. M my question um, and a great talk. Uh, my question is related to the top bullet here. Um, past climate change and the enhancement of um, halogens that you show by this excellent analysis of the ice core data. And, and I'm just kind of trying to spin in my head what would cause that because a lot of what, you know, we think we see when we fly airplanes around in the Arctic is the bromine explosion is related to leads some interaction of, of, of water getting out, but of course, during the glacial period, that's all closed. It's just closed. And also during the glacial period, there's a lot of evidence that ocean biology was raging. In fact, that's why CO2 was lower. The biological pump of the ocean was raging. So 
maybe ocean biology producing dibromomethane and bromoform was raging in the tropics. So that kind of begs the question, is there just more efficient transfer? Is, is, is it being produced in the tropics and somehow, mm -hmm. you know, from ocean biology and somehow being recorded in the ice core, surviving that transit all the way up? And, and, and dibromomethane um, has a long enough lifetime to probably make it from the tropics to the polar region. I don't know about mm -hmm. bromomethane. Anyway, that's a lot for you to think about. Yeah. No, those, are, those are all really excellent questions. So um, as far as the sea salt uh, aerosol, is, um, it is a bit of a mystery. So the ice core observations show much higher sodium deposition. So suggesting higher concentrations in the atmosphere. However, um, modeling studies predict when you run a model in the glacial atmosphere it it predicts the opposite um, and that's because in the model the only source typically of sea salt aerosol is from the open ocean and in, in a glacial time period you have more sea ice more extensive sea ice you have actually less sea salt in the model, which is the complete opposite of what we are observing. So where what's causing all that extra sea salt or what's causing the apparent higher sea salt deposition flux in the glacial atmosphere is a bit of a mystery. But one thought is that it could be coming from the sea ice itself in the form of blowing snow. There's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. And that's just one possible explanation. There are others. Um, as far as um, the um, more biogenic sources of the organohalogens, as you mentioned, that is something that um, could potentially also happen. Um, you know, it, it, it's not as effective as the sea salt aerosol because it's a, these are gas phase reactions and to get these expo bromine explosion events, you need this heterogeneous chemistry. However, um, as I mentioned earlier, it can kind of provide a seed to get all of that started. Uh, there are some observations and ice cores of some of the organohalogen species by Eric Saltzman's group um, at UC Irvine that suggest that the glacial interglacial changes in those species, the species he can measure, and I can't remember exactly which ones they are, uh, but are relatively small on the order of 10%, uh, which wouldn't be enough to, I think, to um, have a significant impact on um, tropospheric reactive halogens. The sea salt would be more effective. We still don't know why, though, the sea salt and ice cores is so much higher in glacial compared to interglacial periods. So, um, if I can just follow up very quickly, yeah. thank you so much for such a great answer. Um, and I'm a big believer in the blowing snow. You know, we've written about that too. Mm -hmm. My follow up is. You know, during the glacial times where these ice cores were being laid, there probably was a lot less liquid precipitation, like probably none, because, you know, so, so I, I just wonder if, like, the lack of um, rain, mm -hmm. you know, the, it, it's counterintuitive because you would think as the ice core is forming in an ice age, obviously there's a lot of deposition, but, you know, it's just not melting ever. Yeah. And so I just wonder if the change in precip could factor into all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the flux corrects for the change in precip, and so you still get a significant increase in the flux. But it has been suggested um, by, uh, like, Bradley Markle has suggested that actually the enhancement in ice cores in the glacial period of sea salt is not due to enhanced atmospheric concentrations, but due to enhanced transport because of lower precipitation rates in the cold glacial climate. So I think that's uh, it's a reasonable explanation. However, what worries me about that explanation is that the models actually, in terms of the snow accumulation rates in the glacial period, the models roughly capture what, what we observe in ice cores. So the models seem to be capturing that um, reduced precipitation, at least in the polar regions, and um, uh, pretty accurately. However, um, it's not even come close to capturing, uh, the, the, it seems to not have a significant impact 
on the sea salt aerosol concentrations, it's the source, changes in the sources that are driving it in the models. So if you could have a reduced source and still have an increase in atmospheric um, deposition in the polar regions, um, if that's happening in reality and the models aren't catching it, then there's really, really something wrong with transport and deposition of aerosols in our models. <laughs> so um, that would affect everything. So I, I'm just not sure exactly. It could be not a source uh, effect. It could be a, tr a transport effect resulting from changes in precipitation. And if that's the case, then I'm, I'm really worried about our global models. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question is from R. Dickerson. You are unmuted. <clears throat> hey, nice job, Becky. Um, yeah. From uh, nice summary, yeah. From shipboard observations, we know that uh, the, you know, the sea salt aerosol uh, is a is a strong but nonlinear function of wind speed. So uh, I don't know what happens to uh, to wind speed on a global scale. Uh, in a in the glacial periods versus uh, current periods, could that have an impact on the rate of formation of uh, of these halogens? Um, the effect of wind speed, you know, would be via its uh, impact on the sea salt emissions. I think would be the largest effect. Right. And um, yeah, I don't. I. Th I don't know off the top of my head exactly how wind speeds and models in the glacial climate are comparing with those in the interglacial climates. Um, this is, we, we just finished our LGM simulation, so we're going to be looking at all of these things. So thank you for that question. I'll make sure to look at that. Um, but um, yeah, I think the, the effect of changes in wind speed would on halogens would uh, result from changes in a sea salt aerosol emissions from the open ocean, but also, you know, blowing snow is also dependent on wind speed as well. And that would be important in polar regions. Right. Okay. So you're saying that a change in wind speed would change both open ocean and blowing snow uh, multiphase chemistry. It would, that change, what it would change the emission of sea salt aerosol from blowing snow since that's um, right. dependent on wind speed. Yeah. And, yeah. And from the open ocean too, of course. Yes. Yes. Both. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I think John, you're you're good to close. Right. Uh, okay, and it's ramp up here. Uh, and thank you, Professor and Sandra. And I thank everyone for coming. We'll put the recording on our YouTube channel and you can find the thread from our Google, uh, seminar Google sheet. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in our next seminar uh, next Monday. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.